Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you because of the fulfillment of your word, that unto you shall the gathering of the people be. Your spirit has called us. We have responded. We have come. And we are believing that you will reveal yourself deeply to every one of us tonight. In Jesus' name. We pray that your spirit, that inspired the word originally, will come tonight and illuminate, enlighten, teach us, instruct us in your word. In Jesus' name. We pray that the teaching that you are bringing to us today, and the benefit you want us to receive thereby, we will not miss in Jesus' name. Thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Recently, we started a study of the Psalms. And today, we're going to look at Psalm 8. I'll read to you from verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Who has set thy glory above the heavens? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength, because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal or silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man? that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou made him to have dominion over the works of thine hand. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. The psalm I've just read to you is a gem of adoration, of praise, and of worship. As we look at the psalm as we read, you'll see it talks a lot about man. And he talks about the two sides of man, the two levels or stages of man. One, he talks about the degradation of man, and yet he talks about the dignity of man. About the humiliation of man, as well as the exaltation of man. He talks about man as one of the most insignificant creatures that God made, and yet talks about man as highly honored of the creatures of God's world. You'll see that the first verse and the last verse form a sweet song of admiration in which the excellence of the name of God is exalted. And the intermediate verses, verses 2 to 8, are made up of holy wonder at the greatness of God and at the greatness of his creation and at his condescension towards man. And yet, as this psalm talks about man. One, it talks about man at creation. Having all dominion, glory, and honor. Two, it talks about man in his fallen state. Three, it talks about the perfect man, Christ Jesus. I'll show you that later. Four, it talks about man redeemed after visiting Calvary and the cross, after tasting of the grace of Christ Jesus through Calvary's sacrifice. And also, as you see this, you'll see that the New Testament makes Christ the principal subject of this psalm. We'll talk about four points on this psalm. You have three on your outline, but we're talking about four. Number one, the majesty of God. Number two, man in grace. Number three, the Messiah, man and God. That is, perfect man, complete God. Man who put on human flesh, the son of man, and yet God eternal. Having the attributes and characteristics of God manifested, shining forth through him. 
Now point four, the measure of greatness. After man has visited Calvary, after man has known the Lord, this psalm describes his position and his privilege and his possession and the provisions and promises that the Lord has made for him. Many people that say they are Christians, they have missed this last part of the study. They have not known of the measure of greatness endued and doubt bestowed upon the redeemed man. Let's start from point one. The majesty of God. Verse one again. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Verse nine. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. You will see here that it started with the exaltation, adoration, the worship, the exaltation of the name of the Lord. And he repeats exactly the same verse at the end. After he had examined the whole universe. And he wondered at the greatness and the majesty and the glory and the power of the almighty God. And he looked into the mountains above and into the depths of the seas beneath. And he looked at the creation of God, things having life and things not having life. As he saw the greatness and the beauty, the wonder of creation. Then he ended up again and saying, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. The whole creation is full of the glory of God. And only a blind man will, see, will say that he doesn't know. Whether God exists or not, as we look at the orderliness of this earth, as we look at the stability of everything that God has made, as we look at the position and the usefulness and profitability of the sun, the moon, the stars, the seas, the land, and as we look at the balance of everything that God created, you must join the psalmist in wonder, in amazement, in adoration and worship, saying, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. The miracles of his power we see everywhere in creation, in the earth and in the heavens above. Mount up, soar up, get up to the highest heavens, or dive deep, dive deep, go deep into the deepest seas, and you will see the magnificent work of God everywhere. The name of God is so excellent. His power is so great. His creation is so beautiful. And all his plans are so marvelous that no words can fully express his excellency. The believing heart is full of praise and adoration as he beholds and as he meditates on the glory of God. Now look at this in Job chapter 37. Job 37, verse 23. Touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. That means he's beyond our search. The more we know of him, the more we want to know. And the more there is to know. The more we see him, there is more still to see. The more we appreciate, there is still more to appreciate. We cannot find him to the point that we'll say there is nothing left we need to know. He is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice and he will not afflict. In Psalm 1, 1, 3. We still see this glory and honor and majesty of God displayed. Psalm 1, 13 from verse 3. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. From sunrise to sunset, as we look at everything that God has made, the wonder of creation, the beauty of creation, the order, the perfection of his creation, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun, the name of the Lord will be praised by the person that looks at the creation of God meditatively. In verse 4, the Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens, who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high. That's why the psalmist said, O Lord our Lord, 
How excellent is thy name in all the earth. Look at Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. And you will see why we need to praise the name of the Lord every time. Nehemiah 9, 5 and 6. Then the Levite Jeshua and Cadmiel and Benai and Hash Abnai and Zerebiah and Hodijah and Shebaniah and Pethahiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. And blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Thou, even thou art the Lord alone, he has no rival. There's nobody that can compete with the Lord. He stands high and lofty, holy and majestic, great and honorable, that no angel or created being can compete or rival him. Because thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth, and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipped thee. No wonder the psalmist said, O Lord our Lord, how excellent is thy name. In all there, he said, when I consider the heavens and the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained, he said, O Lord our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Look at Isaiah chapter 12. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 5. Sing unto the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. You see, no matter where you are living in any part of the earth, any part of the world, you'll see the handiwork of God. You'll see the beauty and the perfection of creation. You will see the things that God has done and that God is doing. And if you have a believing heart, a heart that can praise his name, you will join with the psalmist as you say, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name, thy greatness, thy power, thy love, thy majesty in all the earth. But the psalmist knew something. He knew that this great God, full of majesty and honor, full of dominion, glory, and power. That is not just a God far away. He knew that as great, as majestic as this God is, he knew that this God is our Lord. Think about it. That the great God of heaven can be talked of as your own God. Savior, Redeemer, who pities us as fathers pity their children, who has removed far from us our sins as the east is from the west, and who protects us for the God that watches over his people will not slumber nor sleep. And he takes care of us as shepherd, that the psalmist could say, The Lord is my shepherd, he is mine, I am his. That the songwriter Solomon can say, My beloved is mine, and I am his, and his banner over me is love. This great God, Jehovah, Adonai, called the God of strength by the children of Israel. It is not just that he is a God and master and ruler over the universe and over the angels. He is ours. And today as you are born again, as you think of God in his greatness, in his majesty, in his honor, in his glory, and you think of him that he has sent the Lord to save you, and that you can refer to God as your own father, as your own provider, as your own redeemer, as the one that is concerned and caring for you, as the one that is preserving and watching over you, that you can say, not just that he is the God of heaven, he is my God. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name, and thy power, and thy glory, and thy love, and thy compassion in all the earth, for thou hast set thy glory above the heavens. Now let's go to the next point. The psalmist looked at all this 
and he talked about man. First, he talked about man as he emerged out of the Creator's hand. He talked about Adam in his perfection, in his innocence, before he fell. He talked about the privilege that God gave unto Adam, and it made him to wonder. Look at verse 3. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy hand, of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man, that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou visitest him? The psalmist cast back his mind to the time that man was in the garden of Eden. And he saw God coming to visit man in the cool of the day. And he realized that this was just a solitary man in the garden, only with his wife, just a single family. And he realized when he looked at the heavens that God left, the multitudes and the myriads and the millions of angels that were offering perfect praise, perfect worship to God in heaven. And he saw that the throne of God was surrounded by obedient, holy, innocent angels in their multitudes. And yet God could leave all that in heaven and come to visit Adam in the garden. He was wondering and he said, Lord, what is man that thou art mindful of him? You see, in our own little life, whenever we have something we're enjoying, surrounded by servants and people and wife and children and property, we generally forget a lonely man in the village. We generally forget a lonely man in a garden. But God surrounded by angels, by powerful people, innocent, perfect people, holy angels, is a yet visited man. That's why the psalmist wondered and he said, God... What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over all the works of thine hand. Thou hast put all things under his feet. You'll, you'll remember that is true of Adam. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beast of the field, and the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the depths or the parts of the sea. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1. Look at Adam once again and Eve. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image. After our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Do you remember some age? Thou hast given him dominion. Over all the works of thine hand, thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep, and oxen, yea, and the beast of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever, every living thing, whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. O Lord, what is man, that thou visitest him, that thou art mindful of him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. But, as the psalmist wrote this psalm, he did not only see man in his original creation, he also saw man in his fall. That's why he said, when I consider the heavens and the work of thy finger and the moon and the stars 
Without us a danger, what is man? That thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest him. When God saw that Adam had fallen, Eve had sinned. And they had lost the grace and the glory of God and the goodness of God from their lives. And he knew that he must drive them away from the garden. He made a promise. He wanted to give his own son to sacrifice so as to redeem fallen man from his degradation and sin and bring him back to himself and put him on the throne of glory. And that made the psalmist to wonder, what is man that you will visit him and that you are so mindful of him to pay such a great price upon him? Now you need to understand that whenever we talk about God visiting man, he talks specially about God coming to man to bless man and to redeem man. Look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verses 77 and 78, to give the knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us. When it became clear that John the Baptist will be the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, the people said, God is bringing salvation. He wants to visit his people. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. I'm reading to you from verse 16. Let's read from verse 14. And he came and touched the bear. And they that bear him stood still. And, said the young, and he said, the young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all. And he glorified God, saying that a great prophet had risen, is risen up among us. And that God has visited his people. When the Bible talks about God visiting man, it means he's coming to redeem man. Coming to heal, coming to save, coming to deliver. And this psalmist knew that man had fallen, that God could have crushed man like the moth, like the butterfly, like an insect, just wipe him away in a moment of time. God could have judged and punished man because of his evil, but because of the goodness, the tenderness, the mercy, the love of God, he visited man. Through Christ with redemption and salvation. And the psalmist wondered at that. That fallen man could ever get grace, favor, or mercy from the Lord. After all, God is being worshipped in heaven by the myriads of angels. Why didn't God forget about man? That's why the psalmist said, When I consider the heavens... And the host of heavens worshipping the Lord Almighty. When I consider the work of his hand. When I consider all the living creatures and the holy angels around this throne that he created to worship him. And they are worshipping him. When I look up and I see the moon and the stars that he has ordained. And I see that God can be perfectly happy without man contributing to his happiness. Then I wonder what is man. That thou art mindful of him. And the son of man. That thou visitest him. Let's try to answer the question from the scripture. What is man? In Job chapter 7. Verse 17. What is man? That thou shouldest magnify him. And that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him. Look at Job 25, verse 6, for an answer. How much less man that is a worm, and the son of man which is a worm. That's why the psalmist was surprised, and he said, man is falling, man is depraved, man is insignificant, man is lost, 
Man has nothing to give to God. Man is just a non-entity, a worm. And he said, as insignificant as man is, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 22 and 23. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of heaven of the earth, and inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, and that stretcheth out the heavens as a, as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in, that bringeth the princes to nothing, and he maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. What is man? As I say, man is like three things. Number one, is nothing. Number two is vanity. Number three, at best, is like a grasshopper compared to the greatness and the majesty of God. That's why the psalmist wondered. And he said, man is nothing. Man is vanity. Man is just like a grasshopper. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Isaiah chapter 41 verse 14. Fear not, thou warm Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, says the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. God says, he knows who we are. Warm, nothing, vanity, grasshopper, just a little in insect at best, and yet, he says, I'm interested in redeeming you. That's why the psalmist was filled with wonder and amazement, with admiration and adoration. That's why he was filled with praise and honor and reverence to the name of the Lord. And he said, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. He said, when I consider all these things, and I see that these are the, hand, the things that your hands have made, I wonder what is man that you are so careful, that you are so caring about him. Let's go to point three. I told you that this psalm also talks about Christ. You see, as David began to sing praises unto the Lord, he was carried away from himself by the spirit of prophecy. He was born out of his own situation and carried off into the future. As he began to sing about the greatness of God, and as he, he began to sing about man, he was carried further to see the perfect man, the Messiah. He was carried off away from himself, away from his situation, away from his temporary knowledge, to see the future knowledge and the future personality of the Messiah, who is man and God at the same time. Look at this psalm again, from verse for what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thine hands thou hast put all things under his feet as you read those words and you see it Beside Paul the Apostle. As Paul the Apostle became inspired of the Holy Ghost. And he reads that psalm. And he begins to interpret by inspiration. It says that is talking about Christ. Look at Hebrews chapter, chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. From verse 5. For unto the angels I see not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. But one in a certain place, that's David in the eighth psalm, testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thine hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all 
in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he should taste death for every man. Can you see that? That Psalm 8 prophetically spoke about Christ, the coming one, the Messiah, the perfect man, the complete God. For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and yet he was the son of man, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And this passage talks about the two things about Jesus Christ. Number one is humiliation. Number two is exaltation. Number one is becoming flesh to dwell among us and to suffer the suffering of death. Number two is resurrection, ascension, and glorification. Look at this. That when, he, when it says he was made a little lower than the angels, it's talking about being born in Bethlehem, raised up in Nazareth, suffering all that he suffered, see him carrying the cross, see him going to the mount to Golgotha, see him going to the place of crucifixion, made a little lower than the angels. You see, the angels don't die. He died. He died for us. The suffering of death. But then on the third day, he rose from the dead, glorified and honored, and he ascended up on high, the glorified, risen Son of God. On the one hand, is humiliation, made lower than the angels. On the other hand, is exaltation, risen and glorified. And as you read the Bible about Jesus Christ, you see those two things about him. One is humiliation, and two is glorification. Look at First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was made manifest in the flesh. Made manifest in the flesh. A little lower than the angels. Born at Bethlehem. And yet continued. Justified in the spirit. Seen of angels. Preached unto the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. Received up to glory. That's his glorification. On the one hand is humiliation. On the other hand, is glorification. Look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born. But remember, there was no place for him in the inn. He had to be born in the manger, made a little lower than the angels. And as he lived his life, he said, The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Made a little lower than the angels. A man acquainted with grief and sorrows. Made a little lower than the angels. Unto us a son is given. That's talking about Calvary. For the suffering and the punishment of death. Because he bore all our shame, all our sin, all our iniquity. Everything we did wrong was laid upon him. But then, look at his glorification. Look at the other side. For God gives him dominion, glory, and honor. The government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Philippians chapter 2. From verse 5, Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not trouble to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself of all his glory and honor when he was born in the manger. And he took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, made a little lower than the angel. But see the other side now, crowned 
with glory and honor. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's look at Luke chapter 22. When Jesus was being questioned, at the time he was betrayed, at the time he was tried, just before they crucified him, he knew that after that crucifixion, he knew that after that humiliation, the glory, the honor, the crown will come. In Luke 22, verse 69, Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. He knew that the humiliation will not be the end of the story. He knew that being made a little lower than the angels will not be the end of the story. He knew that ultimately he'll be crowned with glory and honor. He knew that ultimately he will rule and reign as king. All things will be put under his feet. Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb that was slain made a little lower than the angels. When he was slain, when he was killed, when he lost his life for me, for you, that was, it's been made a little lower than the angels. But then, after that, he received glory and honor. It says, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Now, let's see the greatness, the measure of greatness. After we are born again, after we have visited Calvary, and we have tasted of the benefit of atonement through the cross of Jesus Christ, you can see that this psalm also is written about us. Look at it now again. Psalm 8, from verse 4. What is man? that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou visitest him. I told you that when the Bible talks about God visiting man, most of the time it talks about visiting him redemptively. Visiting him to save, to redeem, to rescue, to pull up from where he was before. And the Lord has visited us. The day spring has shone upon us. The light of the Lord has shone across our pathway. The Lord has visited us, not because of any goodness in us, not because of any greatness in us. In fact, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But only by grace alone are we saved, and that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God so that nobody will boast. Where is the boasting then? It is removed. Because what is man? That thou art mindful of him. And the son of man that thou visitest him. The Lord has visited us not because we are good. Not because we were righteous. Not because we did right. But because we were sinners. In due time Christ died for us. But after visiting us, after he has made us to taste of the goodness and the mercy of God, after we have tasted of Calvary, look at what God has given us now. For he has made him a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor. As a saved soul reads that, he realizes that God, through Christ, has lifted him up. Is no more in the dungeon. Is no more imprisoned by the devil. Is no more wallowing in the murray clay. Is no more wallowing in his vomit like a dog. He has been lifted up from the dirt, from the corruption, from the sin. He has been lifted up to sit with Christ. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 6. And has raised us up together. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
made a little lower than the angels. You know the only difference now? The only difference is that angels don't die, but if Jesus tarries, you may die. If Jesus delayed his coming, you may die. That's the only difference now. Apart from that, you are identified with Christ. You are raised up together with Christ. You are made to sit together. Think about it. To sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, how exalted, how lifted up is Jesus? Look at Ephesians chapter 1. From verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ. When he raised him from the dead. And set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And every name that is named. Not only in this world but also in that which is to come. And has put all things under his feet. And gave him to be head over all things to the church. Which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. And it says he has raised us up together and he has made us sit together in heavenly places that means as jesus is far above all principality and power so are you have you ever thought about that that demons are not above you satan is not on your head looking down on you you are seated in heavenly places in christ jesus Far above all principality, all power, all might, all dominion. Far above every name that is named. You don't fear anything that is beneath you. You tread upon all those things. You hear the name of a magician, the name of a herbalist, the name of an evil power, evil personality. Remember, you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus far above every name that is named. And he has put all enmity and all power of the evil one under your feet. As you read that psalm, you see that the psalm is talking about the redeemed man as well. Because he's made only now a little lower than the angels. And has crowned him with glory and honor. This is illustrated in Genesis. Or the life of Joseph. Look at this. Genesis chapter 41, verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and he brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. Look at verse 37. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh. And in the eyes of his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house. According unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. A few minutes from this time, he was in the dungeon. He was in darkness. He was in the prison. But now, a few minutes after, he's a free man. He's not a slave now, he's a ruler. He's a person that has authority now. You know, before you were born again, just a few minutes before that time you were born again, you were a slave, a captive to sin, to self, and to Satan. Immediately you were born again, you were set free. You were raised up in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. No more a slave, but a master. No more a slave, but a ruler. Before this time, Joseph had no voice, no mouth, no authority, no decision he could take. It was just a slave that had no right of any kind in Egypt. But now he was exalted. He had right, authority, power, and dominion. The same for a child of God who is born again. It means that before you were born again, no right, no authority, no dominion. But now that you are born again, 
you have right, you have authority. And whenever you stand to pray, you pray in authority and power. Because he has crowned you with glory and with honor. First Samuel chapter 2. Verse 8. He raised up the poor out of the dust. And lifted up the beggar from the dunghill. To set them among the princes. And to make them inherit the throne of glory. Beautiful. That now he has raised up that person that was poor in spirit. Mourning because of his sin. Going gently because of the load of sin upon him. Saying that my sin, innumerable evils are compassed about me. And I am ashamed. I cannot lift up my head because of my sin. And he came to the Lord and he bowed himself. And will not lift up his eyes so much uh, before the Lord. And he just mote himself on the chest. Be merciful unto me a sinner. And immediately that poor man, that poor sinner is raised up out of the dust. That beggar pleading for mercy is taken away from the donkey and is set among the princes and he makes him to inherit the throne of glory that was crowned him with honor and glory. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and verse 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him who has loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings. Has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. This shows the believer that now we are lifted up. Job chapter 36. I hope you realize that after you are born again, that you have been lifted up to sit with Christ in heavenly places. And when you fight in the battles of life, you are fighting from an exalted position. You are not in the valley. You shouldn't be oppressed by powers of evil because the Lord has raised you up and lifted you up. Live according to your privilege in Christ. Job 36 verse 7. He withdraweth not his eyes from the righteous. But with kings are they on the throne. You see that? The righteous are with the kings on the throne. Yea, he does establish the righteous forever. And they are exalted. That's the privilege of a child of God. Of the one who has given his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because now he's made just a little lower than the angels. And is given dominion and honor. Not talking about being made a little lower than the angels. That's just for now. Eventually, you'll be greater than even those angels. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 3. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Know ye not that it is only for this present time we're a little lower than the angels? Don't you know that ultimately, finally, when redeemed man leaves this world and he gets on the side of Christ in heaven and he rules and reigns with Christ literally and sits on his throne with him, don't you know that the believers shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Let's look at John, chapter 14, verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also. Why? Well, because that believer is lifted up, made to see together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, and Christ has given him his name, his power, his authority, and when the believer prays, it's like Jesus Christ praying because of identification with Christ. And he says, and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father and whatsoever. Ye shall ask in my name that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. As if that were not enough, he makes the repetition of it. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Let me remind you of those beautiful verses in Psalm 8. 
Psalm 8, verse 5. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou hast made him to have dominion over the works of thine hand. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He has put all these things under your feet. You are to tread upon them. Does this mean that he has given these things to apostles and pastors and preachers and giants in faith and people who have been long in the faith? No, he has given them to babes. In that hour, verse 21, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and has revealed them unto babes. Psalm 8, verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. Even if you are a new convert, even if you are a babe, weak, feeble, frail, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength. Because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal or silence the enemy and the avenger. That is, through the mouth of babes and sucklings, through the mouth of feeble believers, through your testimony, your faith, your confession, and through your praise, God will silence the greatest of enemies. For ye see your calling, brethren. How that not many mighty after the flesh, not many wise, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the earth to confound the wise. He has chosen the base things of the world to confound the mighty. And he has chosen the things that are not to confound the things that are. That no flesh should glory 